Welcome everyone. I'm Brenda Murray. This is Studio 56 Boutique. And today we are going to be showing you a gorgeous demo by Ron Stoke. And Ron is an amazing award-winning watercolor artist from Seattle, Washington. He's a regular contributor to and has been on the cover of Watercolor Artist Magazine, as well as other publications. He teaches comprehensive workshops in North America and Europe. He holds signature membership uh, with the American Watercolor Society, the National Watercolor Society, the Northwest Watercolor S Color Society, and he's uh, um, a signature member of the American Impressionist Society. And he's been an artist ambassador for M. Graham Watercolor for more than 20 years. If you're new to Studio 56, in addition to uh, hosting free interviews and demos with artists, we also organize online workshops for artists and we organize vacation workshops for artists. We're going to talk a little bit today about Ron's upcoming vacation workshop in Tuscany next spring. And uh, so uh, before we get to go any further, I just want to let you know that we have a free interviews coming up as well on October 17th with Ray Andrews and on November 21. Ray Andrews is a wonderful watercolor artist. And on November 21 with Albert Kiefer, who's called At House Sketcher, and he does gorgeous sketches of houses using uh, uh, alcohol-based markers. So it's very going to be a very interesting interview. Anyway, uh, I'd like to bring Ron in on the call. Thank you, Ron, for joining us and being so generous and sharing your art with us. Well, thank you, Brenda. And thanks, everyone, for uh, joining today. I know uh, time's um, of the essence and important to everyone. So thanks for viewing in. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I'm excited to tell everybody about uh, Tuscany. So we have a gorgeous workshop coming up April 29th to May 3rd in Tuscany. We're going to be, um, we're our hub is going to be in Siena. And uh, from there, we're going to be exploring Siena and we're going to be exploring Arezzo. And we're going to be touring the Tintoretto Brush Factory. Tell us about the Tintoretto Brush Factory, Ron. Well, that was the prop I was grabbing. Okay. Uh, my my you're seeing a corner of my uh studio and i apologize it's it's actually clean today um but what i what i grabbed was one of the brushes that uh gabriel from tintoretto gave me last time i was there along with some others that i have yet to paint with because i when you see this brush you'll understand why i want to make sure that i paint uh the perfect masterpiece with this brush when i when i do get it wet but if you can see this thing wow it's look, huge look at the look at the size of this uh this quill brush um if you've ever seen my work if you've ever seen any of the demos this one included you'll you'll see that i do paint a lot with a, a quill brush a round uh, quill brush um and i usually point out why I like this better than flat brushes, um, but you'll you'll see in the video and and if you sign up for the workshop, you'll definitely hear me go on and on about why you should be painting with these brushes. So, Ron, is that a mop brush? Is that called a mop? Yeah, it's a it's a mop quill, and and where the the term quill comes in is this ferrule, the part that attaches the head of the brush to the handle. Yeah. Um, they used to use actual uh, bird, seabird feathers. This is the quill oh. of a feather. And why that was so nice is because once the brush got wet, it would expand. And then once it dried, it would dry even tighter than originally uh, wrapped. Nowadays, they use an, an acrylic ferrule simply because of cost. And it's very durable. Um, unfortunately, the quill, you know, the feather does uh, deteriorate over time. And you'll, you'll start to see some cracking in here. But if you can get them, try the, try the natural quill. They are so much better. So you're saying that the ferrule was wrapped around like this and held together with a quill? Yeah, this, is, this uh, material here is actually... Um, a feather, you know, the quill of a feather. And, and then it gets tight. With, it, when it gets and wet, it, it gets, it shrinks? Yeah, it has a life of its own, similar to oh. a watercolor. 
So, so every time a bird gets wet, he shrinks? Well, <laughs> but possibly, I don't know. But the 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 uh, feather on a on a bird, it, there's blood going through it. So I'm assuming it's it's still live. But on a brush, on on a, an original quill brush, this material will expand and shrink as okay. as the brush dries. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't resist the imagery of of the birds shrinking every time they got wet. Okay, sorry for teasing you. Anyway, That's right. <laughs> we're going to have a fabulous uh, workshop in Tuscany, and we're staying in a gorgeous, um, in a cloister that was originally the home for monks, and now it's made into a gorgeous boutique hotel, and we're going to explore Siena and Arezzo, and we're going to eat Italian food, and we're going to be dancing and singing in the streets, and it's going to be wonderful. That's that's right. Yeah, the, thank you, Rod. <laughs> brush the brush factory is is really a unique spot. In I I met him several several years ago, and had uh, many times I've, I've visited the the little workshop. It's a tiny place. Um, all locals work there. It's uh, you know age uh, uh, age long uh, traditions that they're still making the brushes, and I believe that it's the only Italian brush manufacturer um in italy wow. uh, if you paint with da vinci which is a famous italian artist those are actually made in germany germany yeah that's right they just stole the name <laughs> so ron what tell us about uh the demo that we're going to see today so this um this image this painting you you filmed yourself painting a painting go ahead yeah that's correct um as someone who wears hats uh, a lot, I have a favorite hat shop downtown Seattle um, that I visited. And one day, just the light was right, and I and I thought, gosh, this would this would be an interesting painting. I love to do interiors. Um, uh, they offer you know different challenges and and complexities that uh, landscapes don't. And so, yeah, I I uh, took a few images, and more importantly. I was able to do a few sketches there. The owners knew me, so um, they let me set up in the corner. And so I, I did a few sketches and then uh, filmed it for a, you know something like this, knowing that in the future I I could show it to people. Um, if if you guys you know subscribe to the magazine, it, it it's the one on the cover of the uh, February twenty uh, twenty one um, issue. And it just worked out great. Um, the painting was fun. Um, I've revisited the subject many times. And um, yeah, the just one, one thing about the video, I've pre-drawn it from my sketches. And the usually the figures in my uh, paintings are figures that I've added or tweaked a little bit so that they work for my composition. And... Um, just you know improve the feel of the painting yeah so chances are they weren't there so uh i i know we said we we wouldn't take a lot of questions today because we just wanted to get right to the demo but there's one thing i just really notice about your art and and i think i really like it if you could comment and you have the you your your paintings glow they really do and um i know that the reason they glow is because you put a lot of emphasis on the strong light dark contrast right well should we save that for the workshop um <laughs> no. it's it's all about values it's yeah. all about values and it's all about keeping your colors clean so yeah. if you if you the 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 issue that i had for many many years is I would go over that color, leave that color, leave that lightest leave light as as light as possible, and then increase those darks. And and I'm not talking about going over them and layering them to get dark. I'm I'm talking about mixing that color right off the bat as dark as possible. One one last thing, and we should just plug them real quick. Is I use M Graham watercolors, yeah. and they are um, they're the only American-made company 
that uses honey in their their paint their watercolors and gouache and that helps me mix my my values super dark and and really when we're when we're on location like in Italy it it keeps the paint a little bit more moist uh because honey is a natural humectant and so it's pulling in water from from everywhere so you're not having to scrub that you know little cake to get color while your painting's drying here you're spending less time on your palette more time on your painting right thank you so much for remembering that and uh in fact m graham and co watercolors is the official sponsor of your tuscany workshop and they're going to be giving away free free color that's right yeah. free paint. i'll um we, we've selected a, a palette that you we're going to get uh, every student's going to get three tubes and I've, I've selected a palette knowing the area and knowing what time of year we're going to be there. Um, each, each student will get three tubes of, of paint and we'll, um, we'll address it when we get there and we'll talk about why I use it and, and all the, and the benefits of it. Try the honey paint. It's going to be so cool. That's right. Great. Exciting. Okay, Ron. So um, let's turn off our cameras and our our uh, audio and our visual, and we'll get to our demo right away. Okay, here we go. So I start by laying in the background washes. Uh, this is just a, a yellow ochre um, along with some neutral tint and a little bit of ultramarine blue. I'm not going to show any of the distant buildings uh, that are that are um, across the street. So I'm just going to keep the the wash simple, paint through um, my objects and um, and figures. I'm only going to leave a few little areas white. But the, for the majority of the painting, this is going to be my lightest light. Notice how I uh, keep changing colors whenever I want to uh, uh, have a color shift, not um, stop and paint around an object. I just change the color and then let it uh, bleed out into the, the first wash. This painting is a of a hat shop downtown Seattle that I've gone to many times. Um, those of you who know me know I am a fan of, of hats. <laughs> and this is a great one. This was a, a national chain that um, they have several several shops around around the country, mostly in, in big cities. This is um, a big wash of Indian yellow. I really want that floor to be clean and have a really nice light on, on it. So I'm gonna uh, keep, that, keep off that uh, wash as much as possible. Grabbing some dry brush on the furniture to the right. This is a, a rug that's over the hardwood floor. Um, it'll be covered mainly in shadow, but I want to get some color on it. And I also want it to blend into that floor color a little bit so I don't have a, a really hard line. Look, here's the time to... Um, Really put some energy into your painting. Start it off with, you know, big, rich, intense color, uh, big, bold brush strokes, and that'll set the tone for the rest of the painting. My main goal with um, my first wash is to alleviate tension. So you see, I'm, I'm not painting around um, many objects. You'll see me stop and, um, and then go back into it with another color, but the wash is still fairly wet so that, that, that uh, those two colors will, will actually create a third color and kind of make an interesting wash pattern. 
Now I'm just dancing around and getting individual uh, individual objects. This company's um, famous for their black hat boxes. So I'm getting some that's on the shelf, letting that color run through uh, the shelf, some of the hats. I want that whole right hand side to just kind of dissolve into a few shapes and um, and uh, value. Now I'm just throwing in a little bit of color. These figures are going to be backlit, so I'm um, going to go much darker, but I want to get that base color on there now just so that I have it. Use my spray bottle for a little texture. There's a chandelier in the top left corner that I want to um, I want to make sure that it's in the painting because it's a, a really well-known piece uh, down there. But I also want it to connect to everything. This is the awning that's outside. Put that in briefly and quickly. And then above that, I'll paint the interior ceiling wall or ceiling structure. Um, and that'll have to go quite dark. So here I'm into the chandelier. I think still fairly wet. Just wetting down this carpet so that I can lay a shadow or um, uh, some of the detail in it and it, it furs out. I don't want too hard of an edge on some of this stuff, so. Um, I try to do that before I lay in the, the color. Another thing, you know, these uh, rugs can be really ornate. I don't bother trying to match a pattern. I'm just throwing in bits of color and a little scribble here and there to indicate that pattern. It's just not that important. Now I'm into the top uh, inside uh, ceiling. This needs to go quite dark. Cutting around shelves. And then I'll eventually have to connect it to that chandelier and the shelves. Um, and I'll do that with uh, just another wash. Come down and do the door supports of the large window. Make sure you uh, lose some of this tension here in the corner. You don't want people looking up in that corner. You've, you may have heard me say, keep your corners boring. And this is really what I mean by just letting uh, some of those washes just join and, and uh, create an interesting wash. a little sliver of light on that shelf. If you notice, I try to carry, uh, hold my brush um, toward the back when I'm doing uh, some of these washes. And then when I need to, to include some detail, I just choke up closer to the ferrule. Getting some of these little hats and and racks. This is just a mixture of um, burnt sienna and some of that neutral tint as well. Here I go into the chandelier, or chandelier just to um, so that it, it it just disappears. Back 
back and forth, getting some some of the chandelier color on the on the wall, some of the uh, wall color into the chandelier. Not spending too much time on it, just let it let it go. These are the lights that are hanging from the chandelier, and I'm going to connect this one to the uh, door frame. Release a little of that tension just with some clean water. That way um, your eye won't spend too much time up there. And you can see I'm, I'm really brief and quick with it. That's a, just scratching the light on that um, shelf. This I'll have to reinforce, but um, for now I'm just going to wipe it clean so that water drip doesn't uh, drip down into the figure. A little bit more of that frame. And this is the uh, little half wall or little display wall that most retail shops have. I know my figures are going to be darker, so I can paint through them um, as many times as I want to. Grabbing her shopping bag. You can see my little sketch to the top left of the the um, picture there. And when I do that, I try to um, you know break the painting down into as few. Uh, shapes and really as f uh, as few uh, values as I can, but making sure that I achieve you know my lightest light, a few in the middle, and then my darkest dark, which will be um, painted at the end. I'm now just touching a little skin color on her arms, but I'm um, aware of the value that uh, she needs to be. She's the furthest figure. She's going to connect to some of those walls. And then my, um, my main figure is going to be much darker. Brief note on the, the furniture or the display case here. It can be a little daunting when you get into some of these um, little details, but all I'm thinking is uh, light and shadow. You know, I want to leave uh, my first wash as the, the lighter version, and then I'm just going to paint washes over the, the areas that are under shadow. Um, yeah, there will be different degrees of, of shadows or different values, but um, I just keep layering those, uh, those values on top of one another. Keeping the brushwork fairly quick. Some energy in those on the side. These are the shadows being cast onto the back wall. I get him a little, little color in that. These guys sell uh, hats for everybody. They've got um, everything from the little flat hats that are popular to. Um, you know, Stetsons to uh, Derbies. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's really fun to go into these shops. 
some of the stands that are holding up the individual hats. A few hat bands. You know, the, the trap is you see something interesting, especially if you uh, paint solely from photographs. You see something interesting and you want to paint it. But um, what we should be concentrating on is the focal point, spending our attention there and making sure that that's a clear message, not the hats here on the on the right hand side or what's underneath the table. Here I'm just using some clean water to um, connect that whole right side to the hats, the wall, uh, some of the shadows that are being cast. Get a little darker. Uh, this is just purple with some burnt sienna. And that might have to go darker, but I'll, I'll judge that here in a minute. This uh, awning, I just need to reinforce it a little bit. Kind of blew out uh, more than I'd like. And especially the, the uh, piece that folds away. So it would be receiving um, less light than the top. Again, treat it you know, fairly quickly. Get caught up on that stuff that's uh, in the distance. Just grabbing some of these hats and objects in the background, trying to keep the value correct. Uh, this image is, um, here's these, these black hat boxes. Um, yeah, this image is going to be in the um, January, February watercolor magazine. It's, uh, they've asked me to do a step-by-step, -step, so I shot the video and then did some uh, screenshots for the, for the stills, so you guys get a little sneak peek. Again, this is just clean-ish water that I'm just letting these join together and, and um, connect so that there's, there's less tension going on there. So now I'll get to work on my main figure. Uh, both, well, all three of the figures are, are backlit. Um, so they're going to be quite dark, but I, I like to lay some color in prior so that if I need a little pop of, of light, I can, um, I can save it for later. This is a little more detailed than some of the figures I do. 
So um, just the act of him putting on the hat will create some tension and some interest um, to grab the viewer's eye. It's not that um, you need to to uh, spend too much attention on your figures. You know, they're just like any other shape. Uh, you just have to get the really the outside line uh, proportions correct. Let that skin color uh, blend right into the shirt color. I spend time in uh, my book, uh, you know, really spend some time talking about figures and, and just some simple ways to draw them so that they look natural. And then um, just remind you that, you know, when, when we're drawing a figure we're, for a painting, it's different than uh, drawing a picture for a drawing's sake we really need to just capture the gesture and then uh, fill it in so that it connects and, and looks natural, of course. Um, I think a lot of beginning artists tend to want to draw a really correct um, figure inside and uh, the outside edge when really they just need to concentrate on that outside line shape. This is really thick paint. I like to get a, a dry brush on the leg. That also indicates light. I mean his buddy or comparing hats. And since, uh, you know, they're standing next to each other, I paint them at the same time. I want them connected. I don't want uh, a cut and paste figure. I want them to look as natural as I can, um, which means if they're similar in value, they're, they're going to connect. They're going to just blend together. As you get the shapes right or close, uh, people will buy it. Now I'm going to start on their shadows coming from, uh, again, their, their backlit. So lights coming through the window, hitting the, the figures, casting shadows onto the wood floor. And um, I have a rule about shadows. It, enjoy your shadows. Have fun. You know, make them energetic. Try not to paint uh, the exact uh, shape that's casting the shadow onto the surface that the shadow's laying on. If you do, it, it kind of fights with the subject. And I think um, they just never really end up successful. So... I paint, you know, a believable uh, shadow, but uh, put energy in it and keep it fresh. Now move over to the table. The reason I'm painting the table uh, shadow now is because I want it to join with the two figure shadow. Um, I know there's rules against painting shadows and reflections of objects that you haven't painted yet, but 
I have a good idea of where I'm going to uh, put the table, and therefore I I work in the shadow. It's more important that this shadow connects uh, for me than uh, getting it correct. Spray a little water on that so it's a, a nice soft edge, kind of lost, relieving the tension on that. Just a little detail uh, in that foreground figure. Not much. I I want your eye to, you know, obviously go to him, but then then pass through him to the main figure that's uh, trying on the hat. And you can see as soon as I lay in that dark. Um, the whole painting changes, you know, the uh, background recedes. I need to get this little wall a little bit darker and let it join right in with that figure. Um, it just was, it was too light. And I'd rather have this connection than um, that, that light shape and it, it just looks like uh, these big shapes on the right are nice and connected, but I need to connect them to that left-hand side. And, of course, this would uh, cast a shadow. Paint that on the floor. These are the hat shadows. Don't spend a ton of time on this, just... Get them in there. A nice dry brush um, line right at, right where the shadow uh, meets the wall or where the wall meets the floor. Put a little form to her bag. Let that bleed out into that wall. It's interesting just the suggestion of uh, shapes and light and dark that um, convinces the viewer that they're seeing what they're seeing. Now I'm going to just start on this furniture. This is just a, a table. This is thick. This is as thick as the uh, figures were. So very little water, um, almost straight pigment. This uh, mixture I use is uh, ultramarine blue and maroon. Um, I paint with uh, the M. Graham brand. Uh, so it's it's got honey in it, and it keeps the paint moist. Plus, it allows me to, to access my darks really easily. Just painting the shadow side. Let the, the rest speak for itself. A little shadow to the lip of that table. I almost forgot this. There's a, a doorway that would cast a, a, a shadow. So I'll connect that. It's lighter in value, so I can just um, let it wash into this, this darker shadow. Grab the shadow of uh, this gal walking out the door. Again, connect it all. It's just dirty water that I'm letting bleed.
you know, it's really about the, the the feel of the painting. And as a uh, illustrator, you know, if someone would have told me that twenty years ago, I would have probably you know, doubted it. But now I, I really believe that, that that's uh, so important in a, in a painting is to connect things um, rather than have a super convincing realism of an object. These are just some floorboards that are on the wood floor. Use this nice rigger brush. It's great for this. Now I need to start uh, doing some of the signage. We're getting close to the end here. Um, just word to the wise, make sure that you uh, paint this uh, backwards. Remember you're on the inside and uh, that sign's meant to be read from the outside of the store. I say that with um, a bit of humility because I've done the exact opposite. And I don't spend a ton of time uh, with the legibility of this. I don't want the eye to go to the sign per se, but I want it there. I want it represented. Um, like I said, this is a recognizable uh, hat shop downtown, and so people will will know it. But I I don't want it to be an advertisement for the for the store. That's until they pay me. <laughs> Just checking my my level. Interiors have always been kind of a guilty pleasure for me. I, I just I love the way the light bounces around and and uh, how the shadows grab different objects and it's just um, just a great subject to paint. Furniture, you know, in this case, you know, a bunch of hats and hat racks. It just makes for a fun subject. Now a few highlights. You know, this is just um, Chinese white. I've mixed it with a little of that yellow ochre, just so it's not so uh, stark. And um, remember, we're on the inside, so that it would be diffused a little bit. Uh, just a few highlights on the chandelier. The chandelier is uh, quite famous. It's got um, these uh, uh, deer uh, buck heads on on where the lights um, drop off of it. And it's, it's gorgeous. It's huge, too. Um, I think I probably scaled it down for this painting. Just a few pops of light within that shadow just to add a little sparkle. And the hat, hat uh, uh, band, wherever you think light will, will be hitting. Now we're down to the, the nitty gritty. Just a few more little uh, bits and pieces. You know, some hat bands, throw a little color around here. 
and um, I'll be done. It's a fun painting. Um, I encourage everybody to try some interiors, whether it's a corner of your own home or, you know, a, a retail space like this. They're, uh, they're just a great subject to paint. And um, I definitely uh, try to include them in my repertoire. But it was, uh, it was fun, and I hope everyone enjoyed it, and uh, stay safe. Hey, there we go. Thank you, Ron. That was amazing. My gosh, the glow. Uh, it's what I, and I was looking at your book, Watercolor on Plein Air, that's published by Walter Foster. Yeah. By and Walter. Uh, and um, the thing that really, this is how I first met you is I bought your book and I thought, I, I love this art. I have to meet this person. And uh, just his ability to put glow into his paintings is really outstanding. And uh, it's that strong, light, dark contrast that is so gorgeous. And I love it so much. Um, thank you so much, Ron. That was absolutely. Wonderful. Yes. Um, that, that's funny. I, we, you know, uh, Brendan and I have talked about one of the demos in Italy might be a nighttime demo, and oh, yeah. that piece she just showed was a was a nighttime painting. So, you know, take a look at the information. Um, if you have any questions, of course, you can always email me or uh, email Brenda. I'm assuming, um, yeah. and we will get those answered for you. And I hope to meet some of you, if not all of you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was wonderful. Yeah, so if you have questions about Ron's upcoming Tuscany workshop next spring, uh, it's April uh, 29 to May 3rd, and tickets are available, and you'll find all the information at www.studio56boutique.com, and the pull-down menu is called Travel Workshops. Have a great day, everyone. Send Ron an email. Tell him how much you love his art or send it to me and I'll pass it on. All right. Take care. Have a good week, everyone. Bye Thanks for everyone. now. Bye-bye.